My name is Facundo Calcaño. I am actually working for Altran in Paris, in La Défense. And this is a project I made in conjunction with my school, AST, and Altran in order to move forward in computer vision problems and lane detection. It was part of a project that Altran has for an autonomous vehicle and it's one of the algorithms they are using right now. First of all, I would like to start with some words of Andrew and G. He's like number one, number two nowadays in deep learning. He has great courses there in Coursera. And he says that artificial intelligence is the new electricity. He's saying that the changes that we've seen 100 years ago regarding, art, regarding electricity are going to be back again with artificial intelligence. And we are just seeing the start of the wave. So imagine our lives in 100 years with this revolution coming, <laughs> coming to us. I will make a little introduction about image classification and image segmentation towards instant segmentation that is the project that I made. We are going to see some general demos. We are going to go into neural networks, but not also neural networks, but convolutional neural networks are specifically for images. After that, we are going to move forward into how to detect several objects in the same image using RCNN. The R goes for regional, regional convolutional neural networks. And moving forward into better models as fast RCNN, faster RCNN, and the model I used for this project that is called Mask RCNN. We're going to go through the Coolens dataset. That's the dataset I used for this project. It was made in the streets of Beijing. Moving forward to the architecture, some training, how, how we did the training, the results with some videos and some pictures about how well it's working. First of all, when we talk about image classification, what are we talking about? Maybe someone knows. But the idea is that we have images and we have the label of each of those, acti of this, of those images, like the class. In this case, we have two classes, cats and dogs. And we have a lot of images of cats and dogs labeled. So we feed a model into that, we feed the model with those images and after a lot of iterations and going back and forward, we will be able to output with a really little error new images that were not in the data set we trained with and we'll get a result. In this case, if we insert a cat, we'll get a cat as a result. That's the main idea of image classification. One object per image. The problem here is that life is kind of more difficult than that. It's like, it's an easy problem, like taking only one object per image. So we have a bunch of more difficult problems that computer vision specialists are dealing with. This is the first one, classification, the one I've been talking about. Second one, it's classification plus localization. That means adding a bounding box into each of the objects. In this case, only one. So it's kind of easy in some way. We have one object, we take where it is, and we say what it is. More difficult problems are saying and detecting more than one object in the same image. In that example, we might see two cats, one dog, and something that looks like a duck, but it's a plastic duck, so it's a duck, it's not a duck. We can debate about that. That's object detection. Putting a bounding box into each of the objects. Fourth, and the most difficult, and the one we use here, is adding a mask into the image and detecting exactly where the object is. You can see, sorry if I pass the camera, but you can see here that there are some pixels that are shared between different objects. And that's not a problem for the algorithm. He could detect that one pixel will be part of different objects. That's the idea. And that's where we are going forward. We're gonna see some demos, some cool demos of things going on using different types of models of all the four different problems that I showed. 
First of all, they use YOLO to see which are the cards that they are dealing. So you imagine using this in Vegas, okay? Let's go back. You show the cards and they detect exactly which is the number that they are using. So using this in Vegas could be a little illegal, might be, but it would be really good for a machine to play with you. You would understand when to play a two, when to play a, a seven, those kind of problems. Second, this is a problem that a lot of medical people are been solving, trying to deal with 3D images with 2D images. This is a radiography of heart, but in real time. And the idea is to detect where the heart is and where the part of the heart are and create a 3D image of that. With that in mind, we could go forward and detect if there's any like diseases inside the, inside the heart or any issues. They use a very deep convolutional neural network for that. I'm not going to explain it now, but the idea is that with this type of networks, we can deal with very difficult problems. Another problem, let's go back. It's dealing with emotions. You can have a camera with a man and he will say if he's happy, if he has regret, if he's angry, if he's surprised about something. Only seeing the emotions of that person. It's, if we move forward, they are more interesting. He is angry, he is surprised. It's pretty awesome what you can do. So, this is very cool, but how does it start? The idea is that we use neural networks, but here we are and we want to understand a little bit more about it, why, how that they work, why are they so cool, why they work so well, what is the secret behind them. The idea and the most basic idea is that we have inputs, we have weights for those inputs, we sum them, we pass an activation function and we say yes or no to those inputs. That's the most simple idea that we need to understand, the perceptron. That perceptron is multiplied a lot of times, but the main idea is that we try to generalize a feature in that neuron. That neuron will identify a specific feature. And if we multiply it a lot of times, like each of those neurons is a perceptron, we'll have a lot of features. And the network will be able to understand different features to solve a problem. It might be it's a cat, it's not a cat. It might be it's a two or a seven in, a, in, a, in the cards that we've seen before. It could be with a lot of problems. But that sort of problems are kind of easy. We have five, six different inputs, and it's easy to deal with the column, columnar information. And that's where convolutional neural networks or comnets come. The idea is to change a little bit the way that we were working. Before deep learning, we have the images, we hired, we selected, we deal with specialists of future extractions of those images. We generated tons of, of different KPIs or key performance indicators in order to feed the model and then to detect if it's a car or if not a car, like in this problem. Deep learning changes this idea. It tries to get into the model the future extraction and leave the model optimized in the best way. How will they get into the car or no car decision? That's the idea, put everything into the model, put everything to the model to the side and optimize it. Iterate that 100 times until we get to a really good solution. Let's show the parts of the cognets really quickly. We use convolutional layer. The idea of the convolutional layer is that we have a filter. That's the filter that's in the middle of the, of the two layers. And we slide them through all the picture. And it will be activated where the filter 
it's activated. And the idea is, imagine we have a filter that will activate specifically where the corners are. So it will be in the output layer, the one in blue, it will be in higher numbers where the filter gets activated and in lower numbers where the filter doesn't get activated. That's the idea. Then we use pooling layers to reduce the dimensionality of the outputs of those layers. And in order to, to be able to deal with that in GPUs and in CPUs, and in also to be able to after feed fully convolutional layers. The problem is that we cannot fill all the information into the fully convolutional layer. We need to pass through pooling layers to reduce that dimensionality. Moving back to the pooling layer, you can see we select the max of each of the different calls. Like in the first light blue, we select the seven because it's the max of those four values. Same for the nine, same for the eight, and same for the five. There are other pooling layers, uh, but in this project we use max pool, so the idea to show an example of that. In the last layer, we usually use something called a softmax layer. It's really similar to the fully connected layer, but with a very big difference in terms of probabilities. The idea in deep learning is to select the model, the, the result that has better probability. In this case, if we have different images, we will select the one with the bigger probability that would be green. In, this, in the option of cat or not cat, cat or dog, we will select the dog because it has better probabilities. And it's usually the last layer of the network. We add nonlinearities as well because if not, it's all, all, all the time we will multiply matrices and adding nonlinearities has shown really good results in neural networks. Relu was introduced by AlexNet in 2012. Before that, they used softmax. Before that, they used tangent. But Relu works really good. Nowadays, they are using leaky Relu or that doesn't get zero before. Here in the negative part, gives a little part. It's called leaky relu, and there are other implementations that are pretty cool. But let's take to the basics. And after that, when we have a lot of layers and a lot of weights, we need to optimize them. So the idea, we have a lot of images, we input the model, we have an output. But the output, it might be wrong. So that's the loss function, comparing the reality of the data that we have with the output of the network. So the idea is to minimize the, the loss function as much as we can. And to do that, we need an algorithm. In the start, they use stochastic gradient descent, but nowadays they move to other type of algorithms that use momentum and second grade momentum. The one I use is called Adam, and it's pretty good. Nowadays they use Adam with restarts and more more sophisticated stuff, but Adam is pretty cool and pretty good. Sometimes we deal with problems of overfitting. There are two ways that I use to reduce overfitting in this project. One is dropout. The idea to eliminate some neurons with a probability. Maybe in iteration number 11, we'll have a network like this, but in iteration number 12, that will change. And maybe this one doesn't get activated, but this one it is, and this one it is. So it changes every iteration. The idea is to make the network understand that features should be learned in different parts, not only in the same part. So it will be mixing its information every time, and in iteration plus iteration, that will be better for the learning of the model. And a technique that we used in this project also is called data augmentation. It, it's really useful when you don't have much information. Maybe you have 100 images per class and it's not very good for deep learning. So very intelligent people developed a way to generate more images through the same images that we have. You can de de-texturize it, decolorize it, engaged the edge, and with the same images, we'll have more. And that would make the model learn better and get to better accuracy levels. That's pretty good, that's pretty awesome, but it's only for one, 
object per image. How do we deal with different objects in the same image and different boxes and all that stuff that is going on nowadays? The first model was called Rational Convolutional Network Network. It's pretty easy, the idea. You have an image with different objects, and the idea is to generate a lot of bounding boxes in the middle. They are called proposals, proposal regions. And for each of them, we input it into the model. We will have a class, an, a new class that is no object, but we have all the remaining classes. So we might have different results for the same image. Maybe we have a person, but also maybe we have a horse. Okay. The problem with this algorithm is that it's very slow. Imagine having to, if it's slow for only one iteration, like passing a full pass of one image, imagine for 2,000. That is pretty slow, but it's a pretty good idea. Let's move into this. Use selective search in order to generate 2,000 regional, uh, 2,000 boxes. The idea is that they use this algorithm called selective search that generates neighbors in pixels. And then they attach them one into another and to they'll get to that number 2,000. And it's usually working really, really good. They use a CNN for each proposal. They fix the size to 227 to 227 and they pass it into a 4096 dimensional feature. That will be the output. That will be the last layer until the output. The output, usually it's uh, what you use in ImageNet, it's usually a thousand classes. And then they use as SBM to detect uh, which is the actual class of the, of the image. Putting it together, we have region of interesting, interest, we wrapped that image regions, which generate one pass for each of that regions. We select the class, and we also have four values for the bounding box. That is very interesting because they added this part. The bounding box will be one point for each of the points of, the, of that region. So now, instead of having only one value to optimize, we have five the four points for each of the corners of the image, and the class. Well, <coughs> to try to solve the issues that this RCNN had, FastCNN came and decided to include something called Roy Projection to improve this problem of speed that RCNN had to compare them. Instead of passing the, the, passing the, the, the forward pass 2,000 times, they generated one convolutional network. And they passed it only one time. And generated one future map that will have all the regions, the region of, interest, region of interest, in order to then pass it to the pooling layer. That solves the issue of speed, and it's really fast. It was uh, one, uh, one of the best algorithms. It, it won a lot of competitions, and it was the state of the art in the year 2014. But it had some issues. Well, let's explain a little bit about how they did it. The ROM pool layer uses the max pooling to convert the features of a region of interest into a small future map. But this, the future map is configurable is age, height, por by weight. Usually it's seven by seven. And the idea of this is to train all of the network with one pass. Before, in RCNN, we have three different parts, and those three parts were trained differently. The revolution with fast RCNN came with the idea of training the same network with one multitask loss and all from the start to the end, without any stops, from A to Z, with the same weights and the same algorithm. That's the idea that revolutioned the market and the, the, all the image recognition and the computer vision people. 
After that, there was another, another algorithm called faster RCNN. was a little better, and then they improved the bounding box regression. They improved the way that they generated the convolution for the rational proposal network. That's an invention of them. They generated a network to generate the proposals. Instead of dealing with the last layer of the convolutional network, they generated a network and they input it inside this multi-proposal multi network. They have two scores. The first will be the class and the second will be the box. The class, it's object or not object. It, they simplified it into the most basic stuff so that they will after deal with that. The idea, box, object or not object, super simple. And then the idea of detecting which the object is will be in a further pass. And they added something that is really interesting that some of the people that talked before and they, they mentioned it, the different anchor boxes. So the idea here is that the center of the object is key. The center of the object is the key part of any of the objects. Because of, with that center, if you move different bounding boxes, one of them will be good. One of them will be the, the anchor that you are looking for. So that, that parameter will, can be configurable and you will have, for each of the anchor boxes that you pass through the network, the 2K, because it's two object or not object by the K scores, and also K, 4K because you have four, four, the four points that detect the, the anchor. In fast year CNN, they, they generated nine anchor boxes. So that you have a square and you have different rectangles of different sizes. And that was, uh, I was talking before, to be able to train the network in one pass. And this is the loss function that they use. The idea is that the loss function of the class, of detecting the object class and detecting the object box will be mixed into one loss function. Loss function. And that loss function will be weight so that the two parts weigh the same. It's equally important to detect the class of the, obje the, ob of the object as the bounding box. And after that, we come to the model that we use. It's called Mask RCNN. And the cool thing, it adds a third step, detecting the mask pixel by pixel where the object is. You have any questions whatsoever now? Uh, you can do it in French or, uh, because it's, I know it's kind of. So finally, I know uh, uh, no preliminary knowledge on image recognition. So I might correct understanding that the mass detection is preceded always by the bounding box detection? Uh, from one of your first slides? I will go, uh, the question was if the mask uh, is part of the detection or if it's another part completely different. Is the box part of the mask detection? Well, I will explain that. If the, the question is if the mask is part of the box detection. The answer is no. It, now in mask CNN I will, I will explain how it works. It's a third part completely different. Okay. Yeah, this is done in the learning phase. Yes. And the question is, if it is done in the learning phase, the answer is yes. Everything is done in the learning phase. And in the testing phase, the idea is to use images that are not part of the training set. Okay, and it will detect exactly where the objects are. Anyone else? Well, this will be the architecture of the model. You have a regional proposal network, as we had before in faster RCNN. We have a new algorithm called Royal Line. The problem that they had before is that when you detect the box, but you detect the box in a little square that is the, a 
approximation that the neural network gives to that box. But then when you pass it to the real image with the real size, there was a little misalignment. So Roiolign helps in that way. But I will explain a little bit that later. It adds, as before, the bounding box and the regression class prediction is similar as the faster RCNN. And they add the binary mass prediction. First stage, regional proposal network. The idea is to extract the high level features from the input image. You will end up with a tensor of size M, N, and C. M, N are configurable and they are usually odd numbers. And C is the number of filters, filters or kernels that we use. Usually the original proposal slides a window through the image and while passing through the images it tries a lot of anchor boxes. Usually it's K and that K is it's configurable. In our project we use 50 different boxes and <coughs> seven different anchor boxes. So we will have 4K because we have four points for each of the images and 2K as before because we have two different types of objects, is it an object or not, and K because of the anchor boxes. This is the same as before. The idea is that we center the object and we use odd numbers to be able to center. So if M and N are not odd, we, cannot, we could never have a center. We'll have a, something very difficult to, to calculate. Why K anchor boxes? The idea is to have as much different types of boxes to detect different types of objects. And well, as I explained before, uh, there are 2K and 4K coordinates that will be minimized by the loss function. The feature structure could be configurable. You could use a ResNet. You could use a ResNext. And that's more complex and more deep. For our project, we use the ResNet uh, because of GPU restrictions that we had. And this is something that I implemented that is kind of interesting to understand. Maybe you have images that have objects of different sizes. You take a picture of a, of a beach and you have little people in the sea and you have very big people like in the picture. So it should detect the little people, but it also will need to detect the big people that are in front of the camera. So the idea is to generate predictions in different levels of scales. It will use the same window, uh, for example, a three by three sliding window, but it will make different sizing of the image. So the idea is that in the first of the predictions, it will get the bigger objects because the sliding window will be as, almost as big as the, as, as the object. But then when we move back, the sliding window will be the same and the object will be very bigger. So it will activate when little objects appear and not when the big objects appear, okay? And that it's sum one into the other. So we will detect all of them, not only one or the other. That's why it is, it is pyramid. After that comes the, the algorithm called Royal Line. Well, uh, we have some problems when fixing the, the box into the object. The idea is to use bilinear interpo interpolation to sample inputs and to get a better approximation of where the box should be. This is better explained in the paper uh, of Max RCNN. I don't know if I have much time to deal into it, but maybe could explain a little bit later. But the idea is that to generate points exactly where it is, and it helps in that matter. The bounding box and the class precision prediction are pretty similar to the ones used in faster RCNN. We have bounding box regression that produces four values, one for each corner of the bounding box, and a fifth value predicting the class for the label set. 
And after that, we have the binary mass prediction. The problem with the binary mass prediction is that we usually resize the images into the input of the network. But when we resize again, we lose a lot of that information, sizing and resizing. So sometimes it's work really good, and sometimes it doesn't work that good. But it's a problem that is solved in YOLO, that's another network a little bit farther, but it works pretty good in mask RCNN. So you can see that the initial object that is resized in, in this part, then that's the prediction inside the neural network, and the final mask is pretty good, and it's really similar to the initial object. Okay? And the loss function now, instead of having two parts, we'll have three parts adding the mask. And all of them sum in the, in the same loss function, in the same way, in the same proportion. One thing to be clear about, the mask only adds when it detects the object correctly. When it doesn't detect the object correctly, so if it says background, the mask, it doesn't count in the loss function. Well, to sum up, uh, it adds a third brand that outputs the, map, that outputs the object mask. It changed the ROI pool from faster RCNN to ROI align to, present, to preserve the exact spatial locations. They separate mask and class predictions. And you have a new loss function with three parts. This is a graphic, a very good graphic of the model. You have a CNN that gets to the future maps that will be the bounding boxes for the model. And then you have two parts. One part that deals with the mask and another part completely different. That's, that was your question before. One, one deals with the mask and the other one deals with the regression and where the box is. The regression saying the four values because they are numbers. It should be a regression of that classification and the classification of the class. Some results. You can see that it works really good. I'm gonna go a little bit bigger in the images. Some examples. You can see that there is a disconnected object and it detects the same object, it doesn't divide it into two parts. That happens a couple of times. And it doesn't detect the shades here as object. It understands that that's not an object. Then, as I said before, you can detect smaller objects and bigger objects. In very good probabilities, both of them. For cars, it works really good. This is a video. You, you might understand a little bit better. So it detects not only the cars, but the people that are inside the cars. Things in movement work well, could be better. For animals, one bear is very big and the other bear is really small, and both of them are detected. Lots of people get detected in the same image. It's pretty awesome. And now I'm going to go to my project, the Kulein's data set. The idea is that we have a lot of images taken in the streets of Beijing, and the data set included where the lanes are. When the, the lanes were. And we have a mask. So it came one image, one mask with those four values, and the other image, that image, saying where specifically pixel by pixel the, the lanes were. And we transformed it into four different images in order to be able to deal with them. So we have five classes, the four lanes and a background. We selected the image shape of 256. So everything was reshaped to 256 by 256. The three is the number of colors, RGB. We use five different anchor scales. Like the maximum is 128. That will be a quarter of the image, 128 by 128. And the very little one is specifically because sometimes there are some lanes that are cutted. So it's good to have also little, little lanes detected. 50 rows per image, and we train with only one GPU. 
This is some code, just some details. I know if, if, if you can see it there. The good thing about using NumPy is that you can use things like any, like in, and it's really quick to calculate that in GPU. Using here, you can see the any or the all. These things that are calculated in only one operation. Instead of going position by position in the Panda, in the NumPy array, you can do it all by, in only one operation. Uh, okay. The architecture was using Python 3.6. And in terms of deep learning, uh, TensorFlow 1.9 with Keras. I would like to, fake, to thank NVIDIA because of the grant they gave me. They gave me a brand new GPU to work with and that was really amazing. We cut like 30 times the, the time of training because of the Titan XP that they gave me. So we were really grateful about that. We, we did 39 epochs with in 199 hours of training time, getting to a validation loss of 0.57. That would be the loss in training. That's not really that important, the training loss, because important is with images that are not part of the training set. But well, I included this graphic so that you can see. And you can see the difference between the training loss and the validation loss. The best model is the iteration number 31. After that, I decided to change the learning rate and things were really bad, they went up. So we decided to keep this model. Nothing is perfect in deep learning. It's really hard and it takes a lot of effort. But the thing that you need to understand is that loss is the sum of all the other five losses. Okay, so sometimes the loss gets really good for one of the losses, but really bad for the for others. So it's a trade-off that the model makes every time, like moving forward iteration by iteration. It's really important here the, the, the loss of the bounding box. It's, it gets almost 50% of the values. The mask, it's important but not as much as the bounding box. Let's go to some results so don't use, don't sleep. In daylight, can detect the two lanes or the three lines, really good. With traffic, with obstacles, it detects the four lines, the three lanes, pretty good. When there are no, no obstacles whatsoever, it works almost perfect. Detects perfectly the, the four lines, the three lanes. When there are curves, it detects them. You can see here that this is not a straight line. This is a curve and it works. And you also you have obstructions. It doesn't matter, it works. At night, at night that's a very difficult task. It doesn't work the same at night as in day, but in this image you can see it works really good. Also with obstacles. The good thing about this is that it, it understands that there is a lane behind, like, with a, with, let's rephrase that. It understands that there's a lane behind the obstacle. And for, for cars that have different systems, one that will detect cars, another ones that will detect where the lanes are, that's pretty, pretty interesting. Another one with obstructions, it works pretty good. And let's go to some demos. Sorry. Some videos. Okay. So it works really good when the line is <laughs> it's inputted, but when there is no line, it has some issues. But the obstacles are well, well represented. Let's go to another one. In the highway, it works pretty good. It doesn't matter if there are cars or not. You 
can see it, it made the curve and it understood that the lane stopped and they, it started again when the curve finished it. It understands when the lane starts. When there are no obstacles and something and everything moves smoothly, it works perfect. The problems are, as in real life, when obstacle comes. And the obstacles appear, well, that is the moment where artificial intelligence gets to get better. Last video. And you see the, in the car there, it worked smoothly without any issues. The problem comes when it gets to the light and there are no lanes, no lights, nothing to interpret. That's an issue that we should move forward and try to understand how to improve. Well, let's move forward. I would like to thank some people and some organization that made this project possible. First, my school, it's called AST, it's in Sergi. Uh, it's in Paris, and they make a master's degree in English about big data and data science. Second of all, the company I'm working with that allowed me to make this project, give me the machine, give me the utility. And after all, NVIDIA gave me the GPU to be able to work faster. Last but not least, I would like to end with a phrase of Anna de Haas, that technology through automation and artificial intelligence is definitely one of the most disruptive sources. So the idea here is that we need to improve, we need to code more, we need to get into different types of projects, we need to learn more and we need to get into more technological stuff. That's my advice, my two cents. Well, thank you. That's my information. You can have my email if you need anything. All the codes here, it's free for you to take. That's my GitHub. Everything is published there. Sorry if my English wasn't as good as I wanted to be. And thank you for being here. We have time for some questions. Yes. You could do it in French also if you want, it's okay. Uh, I've seen that you actually use only 39 epochs. Did you try to do more than 39? It's what I did. I did more than, I did 30, and then I started to change stuff because there was a, it didn't learn more. It stayed okay. in the same level of learning. So I started touching the learning rate, doing some steps, and things weren't better, so I stopped there. It's the perfect. Yeah, it's the best model. It was in epoch number 31. Changing a little bit the learning rate, it got to a better place, but after that, it went deeply bad. It was a much a disappointment in that moment, but well, it was what it was. Uh, in your training set, do you have um, images where the, um, the car isn't in the lane? Because Yes. The there are a lot of images of the car. Ah, sorry, yes, I didn't repeat the question. I'm deeply sorry. The question was if in the training set we have images that of the cars not being in the middle of the lane, like being in, 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 one, in the middle of the line maybe. Well, as you saw in the videos, there are some parts of the, yes. of the car that moves from lane to lane. So in the middle there are some pictures taken on there, and maybe he's in the middle, or maybe a little to the left, or a little to the right. The data set was made by Pang Xun in China, and he by himself got into the car, started taking pictures every 20 seconds, driving his car, and then he manually collected the pixels. It's amazing what he did, and I'm deeply grateful because we could move forward with that. Yes. The question was if uh, the project was made for research or for specifically clients. In our case, I am working in a specific part of Altran called Altran Research, the research. 
they develop projects and proof of concepts to be able to then move them into clients. Okay, so it's an early stage to show that Altran can deal with deep learning and computer vision problems and then be able to present them into clients. That's the idea. And with this project, there's something going on. Altran has a, a, has a car that drives by itself. He has a partnership with Renault. And they are trying to include some parts of the model, not all of it. Only the lanes in the middle, not the external lanes. And it's a good idea. So my question was about uh, how, how can you be sure uh, that uh, your model will not, um, uh, I mean, be biased by uh, the fact that the lanes are always mostly the same size and the same uh, position on the screen? Uh, I understand. If you have, like lanes of different sizes, then uh, maybe. Uh, well, the question is if the how to deal with the fact that the data set may be biased because of the fact that the lanes sh should be, they are all, almost the same size, same direction. Well, I understand that it's a problem that we, we deal with. The images are taken in the same city by the same person. It's not the perfect data set, I'm sure of that. It would be amazing if we could train with data taken from five different continents with different types of lanes, different jurisdictions also, because sometimes the line in the middle is, is yellow, but sometimes it's white depending on the country. And that would be really amazing to be able to deal with the image that we are going to test them in real life. That would be a really interesting thing to do in the future. Any other question? Okay, let's thanks. Thank you very much.